I'm Gabe Boulevard, and you're watching Western Bass TV. <laughs> Hi, this is Ski Reese, and you're watching Western Bass TV. See if I can stretch the string. Get that first cast out of the way, because I hate catching a fish on the first cast. In case you didn't know, it's the curse of the bass fisherman. Catch fish on your first cast, and you don't catch one for the rest of the day. Probably really not true. And it's happened before, but that's an old curse. Well, good morning. My name is Stan Vandenberg, and welcome to WesternBass.com TV. I get to be your host today. I've been invited to, uh, or inviting you, to come fish with me on a lake that's had the first natural disaster, or unnatural disaster that I know of in history, an oil spill. We're on Lake Pyramid top of the grapevine off of I-5 and they just opened this lake back up after a, a huge pipeline busted and filled a bunch of the lake with oil and they've had it closed down for the last uh, couple of three months. So we're going to go pre-fishing today because I don't know what they're doing and neither does anybody else right now. So we're going to find out what fish do after an oil spill. That's the first time ever. I'm Stan Vandenberg. I do uh, Rod and Reel Radio on Sunday nights uh, on Extra Sports 570 out of LA. I'm also the guy that invented Bass Boat Insurance and have that phone number you see a lot of the magazines 1 800 Bass Boat with San Fernando Valley Hart and Vanderburg Insurance. And I wear many hats. I've been in the professional fishing end for many years. I've been sponsored by Ranger and Mercury and Lawrence and Robo in St. Croix, but I've been sponsored basically since 1982 was the first boat that I got. This boat you're, you'll be riding around with me in today is, an, is a brand new Z20 Ranger with the, with the right motor on it. It's the Mercury 225 XS. I think it's made for excess horsepower. Makes the boat run well. I hope you enjoy the day because I'm hoping I catch a few fish and we're going to talk maybe about a few techniques and, or a few little tips as we go along, whether we catch fish or not, that'll help you while you're fishing too. So we're sitting on a little point here and we just started, so I'm going to kind of see what happens just this first cast here and pitch it out. Uh, Pyramid is, is a lake that usually the fish aren't deep, doesn't make any difference what time of the year, it fluctuates up and down daily because they use the water to pump the turbines down at Castaic, we're above Castaic Lake. It goes into Elderberry, which is the lake above Castaic, and they run the turbines from there to make electricity for Los Angeles. So the lake's really vertical, as you can see around us. Everything's pretty much straight up and down. It's not really a bowl, it's just a dam at the end of a canyon. There's not a lot of flats, there's a few on the lake. Most of it's vertical. Some points that stick out, most of the stuff has got a lot of brush underneath it where you see where the uh, walls get covered with a brush and then the water goes down and grows for a while and then it comes back up so you have these overhanging trees and it's under the water too so drop shot fishing to start with we're just going to play around with if you're drop shot fishing by the way uh, things that come through the, the brush easier and rock easier I use a, a small um, mojo sinker because it's cylindrical and long and skinny and it comes through the rock a little better if you're fishing in the bushes for the drop shot instead of having an open hook I use a standard gamakatsu worm hook, but this has got the rebarb on it that Robo makes, and it holds the worm up against the end so it doesn't go, but it, it'll fish in and out of the bushes and in and out of the brush, and there's a lot of debris in the water from the water being way up right now. So we're going to just try and see what happens today. You get to a free fish with me, and we're going to start right now. we will find out what happens here. There's a little point and a little ledge here. And I have no idea if the fish are going to be here or not, but we're going to give it a run. And hopefully get bit over here. <laughs> well, there was one there had part of the worm. Uh, 
That was pretty shallow. It was on top. I got a little biter here. If you missed the last little bit, short bit on a six inch worm. And then, then he came back and ate it again. <laughs> smallmouth. That's a good way to start. Keep a smallmouth. Thank you very much for the cooperation. <laughs> Golly, did I get you. T typical of this lake, it's full of these smallmouth. The good ones, these are good legal fish, most of them, and they'll run up to, you know, they guys catch them three pounds in here, not fairly regularly. Uh, it's probably one of the best smallmouth fisheries in Southern California other than Kachuma Lake. And uh, <laughs> it's always fun because smallmouth are good fish and they like to cooperate for you. So that was a good first little stop. At least they're gonna maybe be here today. We've heard that the fishing could be pretty good after that oil spill. And that was a good way to start it. Now if I can just get everything else in gear here. We're going to try to catch another one on this spot since that was a kind of a runaway. Fish are picking it up on, there's a top of a little ridge over here. And the fish seem to just kind of want to pick it up and run with it, which is a good sign. They don't, ha you don't have to worry about, gee whiz, does he have it? Or did I get bit? They just pick it up and take off. I hope it's like that for the rest of the day. Like I said before, the fishing usually is shallow on this lake, and it can be winter or summer alike. Because the lake fluctuates so much, the fish come up against the bank when the high water, and and they suspend a lot when it goes down. Then the jerk bait bites and spinner bait bites, the hard bait bites get a lot better. Then it seems when they move up on the on the high water, they're right up against the bank in the shallows on these little ledges that come off this thing. So that's where that fish was sitting. There's a little point that comes out, comes up to a little ledge here. I'm sitting in about nine or ten feet and it drops off on the other side of this. So good plan. If you're fishing, if you're if you're new to bass fishing, yeah, it's what we we call structure where the hill comes down like this, makes a little flat, comes out to this point and it's a rocky edge that just drops off. And the fish seem to want to be here. Good grief. <laughs> Come on, buddy. Well, the smallmouth are happening. I might have to get the pliers to get this one out. You really like to eat that thing. Looks like that's what's going to happen. Come on. Oops. Get back in there. Well, at least we know they're being aggressive. <laughs> I love these kind of days. Makes you look good. We'll probably go to a different spot a little later because the rock walls like this are typically smallmouth arenas. Uh, the more fun, and they're up on the top edges. That's a good thing. I mean, these fish are fairly shallow. That fish probably came out of less than 10 feet of water on the top of this little ridge here. I love it when a plan comes together. Again, too, that fish was a runaway fish, you know. I can, I feel them just pick up and they just take off with it. Usually when that happens, too, if you find that happening, there's more than one fish in the area and there's competition for food. So when, when one of them picks up and just takes off, it's getting out of the way so the rest of them don't get it. So we'll sit here for a couple more minutes and see if we can whack another one. Well, in case you've missed it, <laughs> we got two fish here and then we got short bit uh, again on the worm. So I downsized. I mean, I used a Robo. That was a six inch warm mouth. I've gone to uh, a regular drop shot rig now with a little tiny number two or number four drop shot hook from Gamakatsu and, and I line the worm up kind of almost Texas rig on there with an the open top on it because these fish are just picking it up and running away and we're fishing rock so went to the spinning rod and that little little worm see if I can get them to cooperate and 
and get the swim away. We don't have to do as much worrying about them eating it like that last one did. That's pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> well, a little large mouth. That's pretty cool. You still got to get the hook out of them. Thank you, little booger. Don't you wish you were fishing with me? <laughs> oh, this little ledge right here has just got fish all over it. That came a little bit deeper. I was just seeing what was happening if it went out and I got a large mouth off the deep side, the small mouth are up on the top of this little ledge. And uh, I'm getting much better than this. Yeah, to teach somebody how to do this, I fish with St. Croix rods. I think they're the newest, best product on the market. They're kind of a standalone rod maker, they've got their own unique way to make a uh, a blank, unique to the whole rest of the world, by the way. Uh, very light, very uh, ultra light and ultra sensitive and tough. You don't have to worry about swinging and breaking. I've been using them now for the last couple of years and I haven't had the problem with some of the rods that they get, they tell you not to lift too tall or, or too high because they're not made to high stick, get too much of a bend in them, they snap. There's a lot of different rod manufacturers out there. I'm fortunate to be able to, to have worked with a lot of different companies over the years as a R&D, take them and break them, research and development for, for companies way back. Contender Rod Company was one, and this is 1976 or 77. Uh, Contender Rod Company was first, the first company that I know of that used IM6 graphite. And they came up with the, the concept of, you know, this one thing. They had it for two years before anybody else used it. And we, we had uh, Al Jackson, who was the research guy there, guy that manufactured and made the rods. He was the brains behind it. Bob Scandleberry, the owner, great friends. Even still, we became best friends out of the whole scenario. But uh, Al Jackson was just incredibly smart. He worked for Lou Speedstick for many years as their... Uh, R&D guy and made rods for them and then he took the technology and put it into the, the graphite world and then he went one step further and built the first graphite and boron graphite and fiberglass rods. Uh, Contender came up with those and, and showed the world a new way to make a stick. Now the new composites they call them, everybody's got them, but we were using those things way back when. I've still got a bundle of those I fish for tuna with and uh, they were some of the best sticks around. So, if you ever find an old contender, the older ones, uh, they're great sticks. Y usually people don't know what they have. Pick them up, you can usually get them cheap. New rods, the St. Croix get, people have really done a fabulous job. I can't believe this has been in the water now a couple of casts and we only got one. We may have to move. What do you think? <laughs> I hate that prop, but little ledge here and then it goes down a wall. I might have to throw it up on the wall to see if there's any fish on the wall. I'm going to fire a tube out here in a little while. Man, there's a lot of debris in the water. But uh, smallmouth always like the tube instead of firing a jig where you've got a lot of bushes. Peg the sinker and throw a tube on them and see if the, we'll see if the smallmouth, even the largemouth like the, the tube. So, oops. little guy. <laughs> you guys are really making me look good. Or lucky. All my friends out there will be going, yeah, you're lucky. But I've been telling people that anyhow for a long time. I'd rather be lucky than good anyhow. I've been lucky for a long time though. So the good thing about being in this industry, looks like we're going to get a new worm off of that one too. I was fishing the night tournament a while back. And uh, I went down through the parking lot and all the guys were saying, hi Stan, hi Stan, hi Stan. Because when you're around it for a long time, you know all the boys. And you, you, the brotherhood, we're all pretty close actually. So 
it's a real friendly environment. Actually, it's the best environment. So as you're saying hi to all the guys, I got to the end of the row, and there's two younger kids down there, and you heard them. It was night, so I just I didn't see who they were. They said, who's that? And the other kid goes, oh, that's Stan Vanderberg. He's an old guy. So I turned around and went, how'd you like to go home to your mom and tell her you got beat up by an old guy? But a little later on, I was just laughing. I went back and met him. And, and after that, I kind of thought, I mean, how lucky I am to have been in this industry since basically the mid-70s. The bass boat insurance policy I started in 1974 uh, through a company called Aetna Cravens Dargan. A guy named Dave Warden was the head honcho there and knew that I was riding boats for the bass fishing guys, which they all thought we were nuts because we all had these ex extremely fast boats, Monarchs and Terries and flat bottom with little tri hulls that would go 45 miles an hour and they thought that was stupid fast and the worst part about it to start the tournaments they'd shoot a flare and everybody's boat went 45 miles an hour so if you had 18 or 20 boats all going the same direction at 45 miles an hour the guy that did 46 was leading and when he turned left or right to go into his spot it was like bumper boats for a while and everybody's turning off trying to slow down so they thought we were wild men and they didn't want to do it but Dave Warren goes, yeah, I'll let you do that. And so I came up with a program for, just for bass fishing. Mostly for my boat, because back then, if you were traveling around and you were doing the tournaments and circuits wherever you were, you didn't have extra money, especially back then if you were going from circuit to circuit to circuit or tournament to tournament to tournament. You know, you might win three to five hundred bucks. It was enough to pay for the next tournament, and then you'd go to the next one. You didn't have extra money to pay for uh, a motor or a hull if you broke the hull. So I came up with an idea, mostly for me, so you guys benefit by my greed. If I broke my boat, I didn't want to have to pay depreciation, which on an insurance policy, it's called actual cash value. What's the actual cash value of an old used motor or old used electronics or your trolling motor after it's four or five years old? If you're not getting a new one every day, what will happen is that trolling motor on the open market is probably worth 50 bucks and a new one is six or seven hundred dollars so I didn't want to have to pay the deductible would be 250 and then say they say well it's only worth 150 bucks so we're not going to pay anything or they pay part of it and you get to pay the rest so I said you know what I want to make a policy where we're the only ones that do this by the way you pay your deductible and there's no depreciation for your hull your big motor your trolling motor or your electronics until it's 10 years old you pay your deductible put you back on the water. That way I could continue to fish tournaments without being out of pocket a ton of cash. We're the only guys that do that in the world that I know of, uh, surely nationwide, and it's been going since 1974. Like I said, our policy has been through a couple of different company changes. We've had a ton of competitors come after us and, and try to compete, but they, there are none of them that compete on that same arena that will pay, you pay your deductible, we'll put you back on the water, and you can continue fishing. Well, I'm going to have to do that, but i got to re-rig. In fact, I think what we're going to do is throw that tube. On an offset hook. I'm not going to do much except for just set it in there, and the hook will just skin hook the top. I peg the weight so it's not going to go anywhere. And I gotta find out if they'll eat the doggone little thing here on this lake. Throw it up against the bank, kinda like you're fishing a, a jig. And steep and deep. And we'll see what happens. <laughs> Our company, San Fernando, Valley Heart, and Vanderberg Insurance, it's three agencies that merged. Back in 1983, actually, uh, the industry went through that thing where uh, Prop 103 was voted through where insurance companies were supposedly treating everybody unfairly and they wanted you to give back your money. Everybody wants our money back, but uh, I used to get the call too, well, when am I going to get a check back? <laughs> Tell me, check back with me later. I don't know because <laughs> we don't know what happened, but the companies left the state and a bunch of various agencies decided to pool and jump in together so that we had more markets to to utilize and our agency, Vanderburg Insurance, moved in with San Fernando Insurance and a, another guy named Valley Heart Insurance, and, and we've been going ever since. Valley Heart is no longer a part. The two ownerships are primarily San Fernando Insurance and 
Vandenberg insurance that are left. <laughs> if you want longevity for a group, San Fernando Insurance was started in 1919. Valley Heart was started in 1938, I think it was, and Vandenberg in 1946. So our history is long and distinguished. And we've been serving pretty much the Western United States because I utilize California, Arizona, and Nevada, especially for the boat policies. And uh, we do everything. We're a full service agency. Uh, homes, cars, boats, buildings, business, health, life, the whole thing. We work a lot with the fishing industry too. I mean, obviously we've got the boat policy, but we've done uh, bass clubs and their insurance. I do a lot of work with the uh, manufacturers, reps, and products. Uh, the guys that build the, the different baits, uh, ensuring the manufacturing of and the, the whole nine yards. So it's been a, for me, makes my hobby tax deductible. I can do this for free all year long, which is not a bad gig if you can get it. And this tube isn't working like I wanted to. We made two casts or three casts and nothing. So, but I think what we're going to do is change locale. Try something a little different. We know that there was some smallmouth on that little ridge and on the flat, so we may try another little flat with another ridge on it and a little drop off edge. See if we can bang another couple of these fish. And I'll show you a couple of new things. There are at least one, I got a, an area that's all riprap. We're going to fish that during the day too. And I'll show you something that's a little trick. My brother will hate me but that's okay, he'll get over it. That if you're fishing riprap rock and you're fishing a worm or, or especially a drop shot, it's a real effective little tool. We got another little tool we'll show you too down the road here. Come on, eat my this little tube here. I don't want to have to throw a jig on you. Well, I, I do too. <laughs> but we'll see. All I know is this is, it's a pretty good bite for the for the morning we just got on. It's the first stop, and uh, we just pulled into a pocket and decided to start filming. And the fish want to cooperate. I think there's about six boats on the lake because they just opened it up. I I don't think very many people even know that it's open. So apparently they like oil. <laughs> I don't know. Fishing's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I got a tube fish. Can you believe this? <laughs> Come here, buddy. That away. God, these smallmouth are great fish. Hit it just like you knew you should. Come on out of there. G lock hook. <laughs> Can't get him out. Come on. Thank you, little smallmouth. Be a keeper for the tournament. I was fishing one. And after being here a whopping, what, half hour? If that, and have three keepers in the boat, I'd be pretty doggone tickled. Came off of a little ledge again, right on the top, top, shallow water. I can't believe how shallow these fish are. I mean, I can. They're, they're like that all the time, but it's just fun when they cooperate and they're on these little rock edges. So, I'll just see if it'll happen again. Good structure here. 35, goes down to 40, 42, 43 feet, and it'll come uphill uh, across the little flat right here. And it's the, the ambush point for this little arena. You can see where the slide came off the hill way back when. Come on, baby, come on up. Where are you? We know it's shallow. There's a tree in the water there. Still 32 feet here. Okay, here it does come up. Now, we can throw it up here on the top of this thing. Comes out of deep water, across this little bank here, up this ridge, and onto a, 
a flat, and these fish seem to be wanting to be on the top of the little flats in numbers, so we're just going to test drive this without throwing that little open hook into uh, the brush piles, because there's a lot of them in the water now, as high as it is. I don't know if it's, it might have been a six inch, maybe a foot higher than this at some point in time, but not much. A lot of water with all the rains that filled up all our Southern California lakes, and they are just harder than heck to fish right now. Fish have too many places to go to hide, and they're not uh, cooperating. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty amazing, actually. What is it, May? And uh, a lot of the lakes haven't, we haven't seen a spawn on yet. Normally, you'd see spawns hit in February and March. Here it is, May. All this new water, Kachuma, for instance got three feet more water on it than it's ever had in its life before. Spectacular. There's one. Um, little guy. Um, spectacular fishing though. When it get, wants to get going, it's going to be really good. There were tulies that have been kind of out of the water and along the edges for the last several years. But now when you go up, and those tulies were probably 10 foot tall, maybe 12 in some areas, and that all of a sudden, the other day, we went over there, and you're, you're driving over the top of the tulies, and there's about four feet of water on top of the tulies. Fish just don't know where to go yet. There's all this new places, all this new water. Fish looked a little ratty when you caught one because they, I, I think, because there's, they're up in the shallows looking around, and the, the bait's not there yet. Crawdads aren't in that arena yet. It's just brand new to the area, so they're crawling through all the brush line. And the forage isn't there, but in another month or so, it's just going to be crazy. The fish, there was a bunch of fish up on hard on the hardwood, um, where you could catch fish flipping if there was dead, not not the green stuff, but dead wood only. Uh, the bigger fish were there, or on the out, really outside rocky edges where the uh, the fish would move for staging. That was still working pretty doggone good. We were there for a tournament. And fishing was tough. We ended up with uh, 13 and a half pounds in fourth or fifth place. And I was pretty tickled because I went up there pre-fishing that lake and <laughs> had the helmet handed to me that day. Could not figure out what the fish wanted to do. So coming in with a fourth or fifth was pretty doggone good. It took uh, 16 pounds to win, and those guys, the, the top three guys actually were flipping. In this lake, you can do that. Got stuff like that all over the place. Although, primarily, this is not what I would call a flipping lake. Most guys will throw either worm or hard baits, jerk baits, spinner baits, and uh, crank baits. It's a really good reaction lake. We haven't tried that much yet because we're having too much fun with this. And a lot of small fish so far. I'm happy. <laughs> you may have me. You may be at work, but I'm happy. I'm waiting for one of those drag pullers, though. On top of this little flat, and I think I'm going to turn around and throw out on it. It drops off on the edge out here. Put the goggles down. About eight feet with there we're sitting in here. River channel cuts along just behind the boat, turns and goes back up the lake that direction shouldn't be, these fish are not deep. Uh, there's stripers, a lot of stripers in, in Pyramid. It's a really good striper fishery. It's really good for smallmouth. And the largemouth, there's a, the shad, because the aqueduct come in here is just stupid. I mean, it's plugged with, with bait fish. So the stripers live well, and largemouth live well, and as you can see, the smallmouth are doing very well. The largemouth tend to be they move up on, a, on an area they're not as likely to be on the structure, oddly enough, as in some other lakes. They like to suspend here. But if there's rock edge or rock ledge, you know, they'll move up. And again, it's mostly a shallow bite in the lake. It's not a deep lake. Why that is, I got no clue. Very rarely do you hear guys come in and win tournaments in 40 or 50 feet of water. It happens once in a while, but it's pretty rare. Most of the time, the fish are caught in um, and shallow water and pull like this one do. Come on. Jeez. 
I like it when they pull drag. That's what I'm talking about. You ever see these guys on the on Bassmasters where they're going, oh, 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 oh and they're pulling drag, the wrong reel, or they haven't got their drag set up the right way, and uh, it's just, ooh, wee, look at the size of that catfish. <laughs> Now there you go, drop shot catfish. I can hear the guys already. Catfish Vanderberg. Can you believe this? Come here. Come here. That's a nice one too, Stan. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Ah. Catfish on the drop shot. Only. <laughs> on westernbass.com. <laughs> Can you believe that? Well, I was looking for something that wanted to pull. Here you go. Get off of there. See ya. Now that's a first. And you won't see that on many places. I get a chance to fish with Hank Parker. He got... If you watch that that particular TV version, that's got some real scum on it too, Stan. Woo! He got a catfish on a swim bait. Now that's something that takes talent to do that. Not everybody can do that. It's like catching a catfish on a drop shot. <laughs> oh gosh! Doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> oh, look at that goop. Now that was a surprise. I don't think I've ever caught a catfish on a drop shot before. I've caught them on a spoon, I've caught them on a crankbait, but that was a first and you got to see it here. Maybe it's a sign we should move. <laughs> drop that jig in on that tree, come on baby, bang that thing. As you can tell, I'm an equal opportunities rod bender. <laughs> I'll catch anything. <laughs> Trying to jig up here against this tree just to see if we could get one to come out of there. So far, non compass mendis on the tree. But that's not unusual. Yeah, stuff that looks like it's got fish on in this lake sometimes does and sometimes it doesn't. Now we'll fish across the top of the flats a little bit and change locale. That drag thing like on the last fish, I, I have to laugh at the guys. Uh, Southern California guys are probably more, especially if you're an ocean fisherman, you're really more dialed into the drag of the reel that you're using. Probably comes from, I mean, I know from my side, when you were, when I was young, you're fishing the, the pin reels and you're fishing for tuna on the ocean, the drags would last through a couple of fish and then they'd start to urk, urk, and they jerk on you. Well, when that happens, it starts to tear the, the fish's mouth, especially with the, if they've got a soft mouth, and uh, that'll cause you to lose your fish. So everybody was really drag conscious. You took extra drags with you while you were tuna fishing. You were changing out drags at the end of the day or even halfway through the day if it was a hot bite. So nowadays, you know, the reels you use, it's pretty important to get a, a drag system that is extremely smooth. And today's reels really they've come a long way. Shimano, Daiwa, and even Quantum. Quantum's got a, a ceramic guide system in, in some of their reels now that's brand new and that works pretty good. It does, it, it's just a little different. It slips real easy. Shimano's always had a good one. Daiwa redid all their drag systems in their reels so they're muy bueno now. So most of the time once you set your drag though set it so when the fish is short to the boat even if it's pulling then it'll go out. Don't worry about where he's going to go if he's that close and unless you're fishing bushes and you need to flip him into the boat with light line. Most of the people in, in the west, unless you're fishing the Delta and, and Clear Lake and some of the impoundments where there's a lot of structure, I mean a lot of brush and, and you're going to pull them out of the sticks or next to the docks. Uh, the style of fishing throughout most, let's say, Southern California, Central California, you use lighter line. Drag's an important thing. Six and eight, even five. Maximum is five pound line, six pound line, or eight pound line pretty much across the board is 
what most of the guys fish in the circuits in Southern California for sure. And uh, it's been, you know, most of the guys at the top end of the curve fish that line. Green, pretty much the, the choice of color. And as long as you take care of it, heat and light will kill your monofilament if you're new to the game. Keep it in a cool, dark spot, and it'll stay a lot longer. A lot of guys keep their line in a box in the refrigerator in the garage or something like that. I've got a wine cellar in mine. I throw it in the wine cellar because it's always cool and stays 58 degrees. My line stays good for a long, long time. And there's no fish in here, so we're going to go someplace else. I love this sport. There's a largemouth. It's the first one of decent size this morning, and I just gooned him. Texas rig fishing. Again, we're on the top of a flat, and throwing off this little edge that comes off here just for drill. What are we sitting in? Oh, four or five feet of water here, but this is a long flat, long flat that comes out for the drop off edge that rolls off on that side. And that fish was right up on the top of this little edge that comes off here. And I'm throwing off the edge and coming back uphill. And this is probably one of my favorite ways to fish. I love Texas rig fishing. This is a lot of fun when you when you get bit that boom, boom, get to set the hook on them hard. Most of the time they don't come off. <laughs> but somewhere in this mess we're going to catch some fish. Ooh, there's a pull hard, a little Texas fish. The old rock hopper came through. Thank you very much. Oh, you know, this is going to amaze you. This is going to absolutely amaze you. I am the king of species, I might add, Trout on the Texas rig. <laughs> I'm amazed, and you should be. <sighs> nice trout on the Texas rig worm. <laughs> you guys can't do all of this. Don't try this at home. This is that little rock hopper I was just talking about. It's it's not the normal conical weight. It's just a straight up and down piece with a hole in the middle of it, but it slides through the rocks. It'll just kind of twist its way through. And all fish love it. <laughs> you gotta love that. <laughs> I probably ought to say a little bit about our the bass boat insurance and what makes the difference between ours and the other ones. Mostly the other ones are more expensive for what you get. We start most of the time our quotes were with 300,000 liability and it, that's pretty standard if you own a home or anything we don't want you to lose it over a, uh, a marine claim because they're always big. If there's a big one it's a big one and uh, we can lose the big ones just like that but um, 300,000 liability is usually what we quote, and it's the same as most other insurance companies that have 100,000 liability. We provide 300,000 of uninsured boaters, which is the most important thing. If you get hit by somebody that doesn't have insurance, we want to make sure you're covered. So that covers you for 300,000 and your passengers as you're going down the lakes or rivers. So we take care of that end too. Tackle-wise, we provide $5,000 of personal property and tackle and I think that's the highest in the industry. Um, medical wise it's five thousand dollars per person in your boat which most of the time your health insurance companies by the way have the right to collect all that money and uh, you you usually don't get to utilize it in ours that's separate so they'll pay over and above that which really helps in a lot of cases if you don't have health insurance too. At least it's something to get you in and out of the hospital for the little things that can happen in a boat. Um, the, your deductibles are 250 across the board so you don't have to pay more than that to get whatever you got fixed. The one thing we we didn't uh, want to carry a whole lot on was the uh, 
propellers have been a real thing over the years to keep our, our prices down and the rates down, we, we told them to take the props off a while back. Because honestly, it's the least amount of the problems we have. It's about uh, most of the time, I think, oh, thank you, buddy. Most of the time, your props, if you ding them, um, you're probably looking at, at a, send it to one of the prop shops for 175 bucks or 170 bucks. You get your prop redone and rebalanced. And if you hit all three blades, it doesn't make any difference. And you give a prop back that's even in better shape than the one you had before. If you spin a hub, which is pretty common, um, it, to press in a new hub is 30 or 40 bucks, and it's usually, but if you did both of them, it's still under your 250 deductible. Uh, and most of the time, we just don't have a problem unless you lose your whole lower unit, and a lot of times that's just part of the deal when you get in, or most guys have more than one prop anyhow. So that became, some guys want to make that an issue, but it's the cheapest part of your boat nowadays. So to keep our prices down, we just left that alone. and and it hasn't hurt anything, and that's for doggone sure. Our prices are, are good, or actually, they're the best in the industry, I think, or especially on the prices for the new boats and used boats, and uh, you have to call for a quote. If you don't, if you can't click on the internet there on the, on the banner on westernbass.com and, and pick one up there, because you can download one there. Uh, we'll be able to get it back to you usually. We do a lot of work with the dealers, so it's a one-day ordeal, or one hour or ten minutes, whatever, whichever comes first if you call the office, but uh, it makes a little difference. Ours is a little different than everybody else's on the market. Progressive tries to say that they're they're better, but they're not. Um, there's several out there because we got them in office. Uh, we have one beacon in office. We have availability two two. Um, we use that a lot for the uh, ocean boats uh, and the guys that are going off local offshore, but other than that, we think the policy, actually I know the policy because we own the rights to it and we've been running that same policy for years and years and years now. So when you're looking for insurance, give us a call, 1-800-BASSBOAT. Thanks. Now I'm going to go back and instead of missing these fish, see if I can catch some more of them because it's been pretty wide open. Okay. We caught our trout, we caught the catfish, we caught largemouth, and we caught smallmouth. Oh, by the way, here's a cool little tool. You've seen this on the rod here. It's called a drop shot stopper. And if you haven't got these on your rods, you'll see them on a lot of the different sticks I've got. And uh, it's, a, it's just a little plastic clip that sits on there. But instead of having that thing flipping all over in your live well, or your rod locker, rather, or on your deck, because nobody knows where to put this. You can hook your, your bait up on the eye. What do you do with the weight? And if you put it in your rod locker and you run to the next spot, when you open your rod locker, it looks like the that blonde waitress's hair at the last truck stop. It's all over the place. So you got to untangle, and it takes you a while to get it undone, even if you put it on the deck. So actually, this is my little invention to the world. And uh, Don Ivino and some other guys they got a hold of it. I put one on Donnie's rods at the U.S. Open. He goes, where'd you get that? I said, it's brand new. I just came, uh, kind of came up with it with the guys from E&J, uh, people that make albacore bags. And Jeff Jost goes, I know where to get that done. So we formed a little partnership, and now the drop shot stopper is on the market. And uh, you can buy them in three packs. There's a blue one on the bigger uh, rods, or the bigger diameter rods, and there's a green one for the thinner rods. But uh, it sure makes life easy if you have a frog or a cinco even that you don't want to redo the, the Senko or the Fluke, you can stick it on there and leave it rigged. You don't have to take the hook back out to hook it on your eye when you're storing it or when you put it on the deck. You just slap it in there and let it hang, and it'll be fine. So it's been a real good little tool, frogs and that t type of thing, when you got a big hook and you don't want to tear up the eye of your rod or you don't want to stick it in the cork. It's just a good tool across the board. You use it for a lot of different things, just holding a, even spinner baits or or jigs, whatever else, if you just want to clip it to the rod and hold it there while you're while you're waiting for the next run. Dropshotstopper.com or you'll find them at the tackle shops too. Three packs and go get them. You can pay my gas money. At a whopping nickel or whatever it costs. I don't know what they got about. I think they're four bucks or something like that for four of them or, or for three of them. But it's a good little tool. See the Coast Guard's over here checking the, the rock piles. I'm going to teach you something new. 
you look down across this bank, that stuff is fishermen's worst nightmare. If you're, you, but you know fish are going to be on it because they're going to be picking crawdads off the rocks. But if you throw a weight in it, I mean that that straight up and down weight will get you out. But trying to get it through is tough. So I'll show you how to re-rig this. There's this stuff you can buy called sticky weight. Giving you all my little secrets of the trade here. It's a a weight that's made out of of tungsten and lead and other things, but it's it's a like a paste or a silly putty, kind of gray, comes in these little canisters. But if you take your weight off, most of the drop shot weights have that little pinnacle there that you can get it in and out of. And you can either tie a knot in the end of your line just, just so it doesn't go anywhere. Gives it something to hang on to. And then if you take a wad of this stuff, about like what you would normally use for your, your fishing, and it's just a gummy, gooey little, like silly putty, but it's lead in tungsten. You make a little nice wad of that stuff. You put it on your line. And just kind of twist it around like, like you would your regular little drop shot weight. And the knot at the end will hold it there from going any place. But now you can throw this this thing into those rocks and because it's soft and pliable. While you're working the rocks, it'll come through. Even if you get stuck, it'll pop right off. And we're going to find out if it works now that I've told you all that. And now that the guys from the Coast Guard are gone, we'll find out real quick. That was just a test. They're here. <laughs> you can feel it almost sticks to the rocks down there too, but uh, you can pull it in and out of the rock and it doesn't get stuck like the other weights do. Oh. Nobody will get stuck in a bush with an open hook. <laughs> Put that one back, actually. So we'll try this again and see if we can ca actually catch one. But I don't know how much pink we got left on this thing today, but I'd like to thank you on behalf of Rod and Reel Radio every Sunday night at, at uh, God, I love this, <laughs> little tiny fish. Uh, it's on every Sunday night from seven to nine on Extra Sports. 570 out of LA. You can pick it up on the internet, xtrasports.com. And uh, my cohort, Big Tuna Bill Gieslin, and and uh, the lady angler, Wendy Tochihara, are my co co hosts on the radio show. And we pretty much cover everything on on uh, saltwater fishing or bay bass fishing and trout fishing in the Sierras. And we do the, the roundup on what's going on in the uh, the bass fishing end and then if you do need insurance that number 800 bass boat <laughs> they told me I couldn't have that by the way way back when when I got it because they just didn't work like that you you can't do a, a phone number where you got uh, something happening and spell a word 800 bass boat so they I asked them if I could just get 1-800-227-7262 is that available and they said yeah, we'll give you that. So I took it. <laughs> and that started 800 Bass Boat. We've been going ever since. We're pretty much the choice of the pros. You look at the guys out there, Aaron Martins and Skeet Reese. And, and uh, I mean, pretty much all the guys, in the Bar Byron Velvick and Mike uh, uh, Folkstad or Dave Gleeby. I mean, the list goes on. Mike Reynolds. Uh, there's just a ton of guys that... Uh, we have insured most of the pros. If you're not getting paid, they come to us. If you if you own a boat yourself and you're not getting a new one every year, like some of the guys do, then the big thing is you, you've got to have a company, one that sticks with you. 
and uh, we do. If you have claims, by the way, claims are just like your car. You got to think about it just the same way. If you have a couple of claims, I don't care who you're with, or your car insurance, you get bumped or, or, or you have to go to a higher limit someplace else. We've got all of the different companies in office. One Beacon, which is one of our, the competitors use. We have Progressive in office, but the company we use through Ace does a better job and better coverage across the board for our anglers because I invented it for me. I already know, and I don't want to have to second guess if the company's going to take care of me. If I have a major claim where there's a lot of, li a lot of liability involved, if they're going to stay with me or, or defend me at the end. But this company will, a lot of them will pay the bill and then leave. So I'm pretty confident that the company we've got is the right one. And they've been taking care of the guys on the pro circuits and the, just the private voters alike for years and years and years. And I've been like, this thing's been going since 1974. So since I'm the guy that invented the, the boat, the bass boat insurance policy in the first place, uh, many have tried and many have gone the way of the buffalo, but we're still here. So if you got a, a new boat or an old boat and you want to quote, you can give us a call at 1-800-BASSBOAT is 1-800-227-7262, San Fernando Valley Heart Insurance and, and Vandenberg Insurance, and we'll go from there. And I got another stick. There's a lot of that stuff in the water here. A <laughs> uh, little one. Oh, that's a keeper. <laughs> ah, little keeper. Barely. Oof. Boy, you ate that thing big time, didn't you? Ishula. Come on. Oops. Okay, I don't want to pull you on and break you off. Better fish. And that's, if you're fishing tournaments, this is the kind you want. Ah, got that little tiny drop shot hook. I mean, this is a little tiny drop shot hook, that number four hook in them. But this is what we've been kind of catching when we weren't on camera. Up and down the I-5 where the rocks were and came across to the other side of the ridge here. I probably have to, ought to say thank you to my sponsors while we're doing this. Ranger Boats, Anglers Marine over there takes great care of me and uh, Mercury Motors. Since 1982, I've been lucky enough to be sponsored by the best in this industry. Maxima Fishing Line, I've been with them since about the same time, 1978 or 79 back then. Robo Worms is the guys that take care of me and probably we catch more fish. You know, you don't have to say much about those as far as colors wise we're using here. Warmouth, Oxblood, and the FX worm that they have. Uh, Margarita Mutilator has been pretty good today while we've been playing around with all this. Lawrence Electronics are part of the boat and have been. I've been with Lawrence since uh, I think about 83. And. Uh, the many others that take care of me, um, St. Croix rods and reels now, uh, the Mojo people, Gamakatsu hooks, and there's another fish. <laughs> Gotta love this, don't you? I mean, we, this is just a nuts day for, you know, fish that have been in the oil can for the last little bit. <laughs> uh, I love this sport. Oh, yeah, another chunky fish, man. I, this, this is okay. Come back, come back, come back, come back. I'm fishing six pound fluorocarbon Maxima. By the way, that's the the hottest thing on the market lately is the fluorocarbon line that, that are out. And Maxima can't keep it in stock. It rolls off the, the wall pretty quick. Um, it's a Different kind of line. Fluorocarbon is a more brittle, stiffer line than regular monofilament. So, and it doesn't have necessarily the same knot strength or kink strength if you happen to catch a fish on it, by the way. So make sure you tie your knots more often. Check your line. A, a nick in monofilament is uh, you don't get as many. This stuff is, since it's a little bit more brittle, just so you know. For, and it doesn't have the stretch in it for reaction baits, your spinner baits, and crank baits, and 
and uh, even surface baits because it's not stretching it you get a better hook set in it but it is more it doesn't come off the, uh, the reel the same a uh, little different feel to it, different castability to it, so it's something you have to get used to. Kind of like the braided lines if you get into that Power Pro. It's been very, very good to me. And uh, of course, 800 Bass Boat, the business, San Fernando Valley Heart and Vanderburg Insurance. And Rod and Reel Radio again. There's another fish. You gotta love this. <laughs> Little tiny guy. <laughs> but. But at least they're eating for us today, I'll tell you. They are not shy. Still using the standard drop shot rig because they just wanted it. We, we caught fish on a few other things, but I'll tell you. All in all, it's been a lot of fun. And I know I got to run for the day, but I'd like to thank you ah, for being a part of, uh, or letting me share with you, actually a part of my life that has made a lot of difference in my life for sure because I've been able to follow my dream and my passion for a long time and hopefully I'll get a, long more, a lot more time to do it but uh, thanks to westernbass.com and uh, Tony for taking the time to come all the way down here from up north and spend a few time, a few hours out here on the pond and I know he's got to run too but, but thanks for showing up and thanks for being a part and good luck fishing my best wishes to you for big fishes we'll catch you later <laughs>